So welcome everyone. Um, basically, if you have any questions, please use the chat function and, and Joan will field the questions and feed them to me. Um, all questions are welcome. You know, they're, they're actually helpful. Um, so we're gonna be talking about G's Ben and the quilt makers from G's Ben. Um, this is an extraordinary group of, of ladies. Um, they're really a, a hybrid kind of grown in hardship, isolation with grit and spirit. They, they come from a very, very, um, uh, the background is a very poverty stricken area of, of Alabama. Um, Gee's Bend is on the Alabama River and it, it's not an island, but it's sort of a peninsula that's surrounded by the, the uh, Alabama River. So, um, uh, and it's on a bend in the river, <laughs> as you would expect from that name. Um, the quilts that they created um, are, are really, um, utilitarian to begin with. They were used for bedding and for warmth um, out of scraps of old worn clothing, seed sacks, uh, remnants of, of just anything that they could get their hands on. And um, they created these stunningly beautiful works of art out of that. Um, I'm, I'm going to be focusing in on really on three or four of, of these ladies throughout, throughout the talk. Um, though there are at least, I believe, 18, about 18 of them that are on the, on their website. There is a website that's devoted, that's a beautiful website, and it goes into depth on each one of the artists, basically, you can go in and look at their individual quilts, and some of them have as many as 16 quilts on, on, the, on their homepage. Um, so I would recommend that, but I'm going to have that um, at the end. I'll have the link shown. Um, they... They, as I said, it, it grew up in isolation, and I'm going to talk a lot more about the history of that, but they are now recognized by the art world. They were really um, discovered by a art collector, art historian um, uh, by the name of uh, William Arnett, and in the, he really, you know, he saw a picture of, of, of a few of their quilts strewn across a, a, a wood pile through some uh, article that was written and, and, and just came down to Alabama searching them out. And he, his life was changed and so were theirs. Um, basically the, the, the G's Bend quilts are in the collection of the Whitney, the Metropolitan, um, Minneapolis Museum, uh, the Texas Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, there's all museums throughout the country own and have exhibited, done, done shows of their work. Um, the show that I'm specifically uh, targeting right now is um, at the Baltimore Museum of Art and um, it, it's a little bit mushy as far as what the end dates are. It's said through May 12th, but now they're saying through August. So, you know, hey, things are changing all the time with COVID and all that. So what I wanted to do was, I'm, I'm going to read you this little bit that I've got over here. Um, Gee's Bend, Alabama is home to generations of extraordinary Black craftswomen 
whose quilts represent a crucial chapter in the history of American art. Since the mid 1800s, women of Cheese Ben have transformed worn clothes, sacks, and other fabric remnants in, into patterns that surpass the boundaries of the genre. Born out of necessity, the quilts provided warmth for family and friends while bearing witness to the shared knowledge passed down among the quilting groups and the female and female lineage. But in 1966, at the height of the civil rights movement and activism, the, the quilters transformed their artistic practice into collective action by forming the Freedom Quilting Bee. This cooperative championed the vision and production of G's Ben quilters in national auctions, uh, commercial partnerships, empowering the quilters and uh, reworking systems of American quilting. So um, that's, that's basically our story to begin with. Now, what I'm going to do is, is, is say, take a look at the quilt on the right. This is, this is made of worn out remnants from old blue jeans for the most part with, with this, this extraordinary kind of patterning that, that, that they all are involved in. They're, they're really looking at an all over abstract design. They, they really, as, as opposed to the, the symmetrical patterning and grid like um, um, consistent pattern that's used in normal quilting. I mean, basically they, they do use motifs that are used in other quilts but there is no um, other area where a focused development happened quite like this. Um, and the, 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 one, the one on the left is just an exquisite piece. Um, uh, this Mary Lee uh, Bendolf is, is one of the artists that I'm going to be focused on. And I'm calling them artists. They call them quilters. They call them outsider artists or whatever they want to call them. But these, just the, the, the color choices that are made are extraordinary. So I'm going to move on. Okay. And, you know, housetop variation. Okay. One of the things that I'm going to also talk a little bit about is, you know, uh, Louisiana Bendolf is maybe related to the other woman. I'm not sure she is. Um, one of the things you're going to find is a lot of these last names overlap, but aren't necessarily relatives, or they could be relatives. I don't know. It's sometimes aunts and uncle, I, I mean, aunts and, 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 and mothers and grandmothers and things like that. And other times it's not. And I'll go into more of that too, because I'm going to talk about the history of the area, which is, is pretty interesting. Okay. And the textural quality of these things is, is something that, 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 you know, basically what they would do is they would piece on their own and, you know, basically put the, put the pieces together and then, and then they get together as a group and quilt. So you can see the funkiness of this stuff. You can see how, you know, it's, it's wiggly. It's, you know, the edges don't line up and all that. And that's part of the really beautiful, um, in my opinion, uh, quality of these pieces. They're funky, they're, they're earthy, they're soulful, and just great color. Okay, 
and you know the, this business of of the positive and negative shapes, the the way you know the um, the forms interact. Having having these these were not you know educated people exposed to museum going or anything like that. So it's it's really remarkable how much there the 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 parallels to things that were going on in the abstract expressionist movement in in European art. These people were not exposed to any of that, but but in these pieces you see so much that that parallels. Okay, so again, this is a Matisse. But the use of black and the use of white and how that how that all interacts is is what I was talking about. Um, I'm going to go back to this, and you can feel the the pulse in these pieces. How the how the interaction of the black and white really really moves the eye around the piece. They're very vibrant, very you know strong powerful patterning and we'll go back to Matisse and you can see again the, the rhythms that are set up by the blacks and whites and the interactions of the shapes okay lying in bed staring at the roof of the cabin so they were abstracting from their surroundings to create the patterns that they used in many of these quilts. Now, you know, the one, the one on the right is, you know, it's, that's more of a, you know, traditional quilt-like approach, but look at the, look at the color changes, look at the changes of, 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 of the, the, um, patterns and, and all of that. It just extraordinary. Larry, yes. somebody asked if they design these collaboratively and work on them together, how do they decide who takes credit? They, they do not work on the designing together. They, they individually uh, piece them, okay? And then they get together and and do a quilting B. Okay, so there's always a leader when it comes to how these are laid out, what the composition is and all of that. So they're, they're really, you know, they definitely are individual pieces. And I, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into that. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight at least three or four of these folks so that you can actually see the unique quality of, of what happens in their hands. Um, that to me is, is, is a, a very exciting thing. Um, so good question though. <laughs> and this is, this is, you know, this is going back to 1960, you know, you can see the, you know, the faded, you know, work clothes that went into this piece. Yeah, you know, these folks were in in extreme extreme poverty, um, and and basically what it comes down to is um, they you know they lived in in you know in houses that kind of the wind blew through and stuff like that. There was not much insulation. Um, they didn't. For a period of time, they didn't they didn't even have beds and things like that back in the back in the um, in the 30s. Well, actually, let me let me let me go back and and do my do my little um, uh, timeline on them so that you can get some idea of, of where this is all coming from. And this is probably a good one to stop at to do this. So, um, geez, Ben was um, first kind of 
colonized. Uh, this guy by the name of G um, uh, actually created a plantation in 1816. Um, he uh, sold that to um, a fellow by the name of Mark Petway. And Petway forced, uh, they, they say around 101 slaves to march down from um, South, South Carolina, North Carolina to, to, to Alabama to this, to this plantation. And that was in 1845. Um, of course, 1861. Now, one of the other things you notice, Loretta Petway, um, all the slaves that, that, that worked for Petway were uh, given his last name. So there's a gazillion Petways and not all of them are directly related to each other that are, that are living in uh, G's Bend. Um, okay. So basically the slaves were freed in 1861. Uh, they became tenant farmers, which was not much better than slavery. Um, Petway sold the plantation in 1895. Um, and then basically it was taken over by, by another um, agent that continue the sharecropping thing. In, in 1929, in the depression, 1929 to 32, cotton fell so low that, that basically um, they, they couldn't make payments on, on the goods that, they, that, that, the, that they had been buying at, on credit at the store. Um, that, that was run by the plantation. And so they foreclosed and they took everything. They, they would go in and just take, take the corn out of the corn cribs and in the, in the barns, they take all the animals. Um, so by 1933, this was, this was really, really ravaged. And, and um, when Roosevelt came in, he actually designated them as, as well, that the county that they were in was the poorest county in the country. And G's Bend was designated the poorest town in, in all of, of that county. So um, Roosevelt sent in farm assistants, did set up road work, um, uh, ex actually um, did housing projects in the area by 1940. Um, I will have some pictures a little bit later on of, of some of the development that happened out of that. Um, they also set up um, basically that, that, that the tenant farmers could buy, far buy the farmland by 1945. Um, now, there's no electricity until, until the 60s out there. Um, so this gives you some idea of the kind of primitive situation that these folks were living in. It, and um, in 1965, Martin Luther King came to one of the churches in, in G's Bend because he had heard about them and, and preached a sermon out there. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a ferry across the Alabama River after the Martin Luther King um, uh, uh, sermon, um, <laughs> the, um, basically they suspended the ferry service the state suspended the ferry service for a period of time. Um, in 1966, they formed the, the Freedom Quilting um, Cooperative. And basically they made, they made money for the first time from doing their quilts. 
um, although there were they were commercially applicable, so the creative end of it, the improvisational aspect of these things, which I truly love, the creative end of it was kind of curtailed in that because they were trying to make a commodity. So they were following certain patterns that that Bloomingdale's wanted. Um, and and they were cleaning up the production, you know, even stitching and all that kind of thing, which is understandable, but but definitely restrictive. And many of the the G's men ladies didn't didn't like that aspect of what was going on there. It really stifled their 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 minds and and their vision. And so here we go. Yeah. This is this is the kind of circumstances these you know log log buildings with mud for uh, grouting. And here, here we have, this is the Petaway Plantation building, which was still up um, in the 30s and they took it down, they demolished it in, in 1940 as part of the, um, the federal works program. Um, it was really a symbol of the, of the, the repression that, that that these people lived with. So it was, it was really something that was worth taking down. And on, on the right, you can see one of the new um, housing projects that, that, um, that the New Deal brought in. Okay. And again, here we go. Log cabin from the 30s. She's been was designated one of the poorest areas of the country. Um, so you can see in this in this uh, this quilt the kind of architectonic elements that they were drawing from the the surrounding area. What they what they were doing was looking at what was what they lived with, and integrate that in, into their into their quilts. Now, this is Joseph Albers. And again, integrating the, the notion of architectural elements into, into a pattern, an abstracted pattern. And Albers was one of the leading colorists of the 20th century. He was Bauhaus, he actually was one of the teachers from the Bauhaus, came to the United States, um, taught at Black Mountain College down in, down in um, uh, North Carolina, and also was one of the longest teach, teachers at, at Yale who basically taught color theory. Um, for me, I love his work. I think this is a beautiful piece. It, it just, it's the parallels between this and the quality of the color in the, in the G's Ben ladies, um, you know, they, they were extraordinary. And, and you can see that the notion that, that you, of using um, architectural elements to create an abstract piece is something which was at play in the 20th century in, in modernism um, among uh, Western artists. Here, here is again, here's Sean Scully's work. He took, he takes all these, these photographs, but you know, basically it's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship between what's going on in the photograph and what's going on in his painting, but you can see how he drew off the, the geometric and textural um, elements in, in the architecture to create his paintings. 
So the same thing is true of these folks. There's, there's that element in there. Okay, I'm gonna move along here. <laughs> ah. And um, so this is, this is Sally. Uh, <laughs> just beautiful color. On the, on the left is a Paul Clay. Um, these quilts hold up well up next to one of the great geniuses of the 20th century. Uh, and you can, you can begin to see the, the unique approaches that these, that these folks were taking. These artists are definitely on their own paths. They're finding their own, their own rhythms and their own way of, of, of collaging these things together, piecing. And this is again, this is Matisse, um, you know, looking at the shapes. You know, you look at the shape movements in in these pieces, and then go to Matisse. The joyfulness of the of the color. You know, it, given given the the extreme poverty. You know, to to have that kind of buoyance in in these utilitarian things is quite extraordinary. I mean, you know, here, here are a couple more that, I mean, the one, the one on, on the right, it's a window within a window, within a window, within a window. Um, uh, and, and this piece on the left, is just like, you know, that snail from Matisse. I, I love the uneven, edging and all of that, the kind of, you know, this natural kind of earthy quality to them. It's just, it, it, it thrills me. I love this stuff. Uh, you'll excuse me. <laughs> okay. You're noticing that, Larry, that you really love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, uh, so I, great I, thought it was, I thought I was keeping it a secret. <laughs> Your enthusiasm is contagious. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so here, here we are in the '30s, you know, and and basically they're they're um, she's in the process of machine machine quilting, I believe. I'm I'm not sure. You know, I know very little about quilting. So there may be people out there who know a heck of a lot more than I do about quilting, um, but I do know what I'm seeing here. And basically, you know, if you notice, the walls of, of this cabin are covered with newspaper. That was their insulation. <laughs> but it's also, you know, they put it up there. It's pretty interesting. It's a patchwork. It's another kind of quilt. Um, and here are some of the ladies. And here they're, you know, basically on on the on the right, we've got a shot of of one of them actually involved in one of the 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 quilting the group quilting um, bees that they would do. Um, let's see. Okay. Now. Uh, this is, this is Nettie Young. Now, this lady was born in, you know, uh, 1916. Um, and this extraordinary quilt was done in 1971. It's just like, you know, uh, it's the Milky Way. Um, so I started working quilts when I was a child. My mother would have me sit with her and I was watching her putting scraps together, doing 
like she was doing. She'd drop scraps at her feet and I'd, I'd be picking them up. My mama looked at, at the things, at the thing and told me I did good. I felt good. Like I had done a big job. I always loved sewing. I made all my children's clothes. Didn't need a pattern. Same with quilts. If I seen a dress or a quilt or something I liked, I can make it. I just draw it out the way I want it. In, in, the, in the quilting bee time, I started using patterns, but I shouldn't have done it. It, it broke the ideas I had in my head. I should have stayed with my own ideas. I kept making quilts all the way up to the last year. I still got the feeling every now and then to sew, but I don't have the mind to do it now. My hands are good, but I ain't quite got the spirit. Not like before, when I'm always ready, day and night, age got me. You know, looking at these pieces, you know, the choices of putting those kind of blue purple things and the variation in in the in the reds, you know, just the slight variation that one that one square in there of that brighter red, they're really just extraordinary things. Subtle choices. Okay. And here we have Nettie Young from 1935. That same lady. So that this is an early one and you can see the weathered clothing, the, you know, worn worn out jeans and old shirts. And then the Sears corduroy. They they got they got a uh, hold of a bunch of corduroy in the in the the sixties or early seventies and did a whole bunch of things out of the corduroy. Okay. And you know these big abstract shapes. These you know, it's just extraordinary. You know, this is like, again, again, back to that, the, those, those shapes of Matisse, the circ the circling forms, the dimensionality of the thing is, is, you know, that's, that's something that I look at and, and find really constantly exciting about these things. They, they're, they're, always playing around with these figure ground shapes and, and, and all that. There's a real three dimensionality to the one on, on the left. And this beauty on, on, on the right is very meditative. It's calm, it's quiet. But... Okay. And here is Mary Lee Bendoff. Um, standing in front of one of her quilts at the Boston Museum. Um, and she was the one that did those first two quilts that were on the opening page. One, one was with uh, um, the blue jeans and the red, and, um, and the other one was just, <laughs> well, I won't, I won't go back there. Um, so these ladies, um, were were bust out to to you know Arnott Arnott set this up. He actually set up the there was a show at um, uh, the Minneapolis Museum of Art, and that show traveled. It actually went to the Whitney. It was and and the Whitney show was just 
extraordinarily well attended. Um, there, there were, you know, I, I, my wife and I went to see that show and I was just blown away by these people. Um, you know, so I'm going to focus in on, on Mary Lee for a little while here and just do, do, do a, a bunch of these pieces. Um, and these are, you know, these are fairly contemporary pieces. These, these are not that going back that far. You know, we're talking about something which has been passed down generation to generation to generation. Um, and so, you know, the idea of the atelier of the, of the, the, the training with with a master and all that, it's not that different from what goes on in Western in Western art, um, but no one knew about this. They're just such joyful pieces. One of the things, uh, you know, basically, um, they they when they sit down to do the quilting together, they they'll they'll all hang out and do gospel, and they'll sing together while they're while they're while they're uh, while they're stitching, which is pretty extraordinary too. There, there's actually a um, a PBS film. Um, and I've got a link to that at the end of this thing too, which I recommend to anybody who's interested in going any further with this. Um, and you get to hear them sing and you get to see them take, take the bus ride from G's Bend to, uh, to Minneapolis. And it's just hysterical. Larry, somebody wanted to know when the Whitney show was, what year do you remember? Oh God. Uh, it, it had to have been, um, it was in the mid nineties. No, 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 no. It wasn't that, that far back. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got the book right here. <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is the book. Oh, let's see if I can get it. And let's see what, what the date is in here. Uh, this this started out at the Houston Museum of Art, um, and let's see the date, two thousand two. So I believe it was two thousand three when it got to um, the um, the Whitney. Okay, so uh, on we go. Ah. A, Again, you know, housetop variations. Um, one of the things that they that they did was, and I got some paperwork here somewhere that's going to help me with this one. They they have categories that they that they use for these things. So there's housetop and bricklayer. There's um, geometric pattern. There's um, uh, abstraction and improvisation. Well, they're all in cars. Um, let's see. What else did we come here? Uh, corduroy. Sears corduroy. That's a category. Um, and then there's work clothes. And, you know, so they, they had certain categories that they broke things down into. And this is all Mary Lee Bendoff's work that I've been showing you in, in these recent pieces. So you can see, you can see a certain kind of handprint, a certain kind of aesthetic that's being brought to these. Um, that was that was the development of this one artist. And now we move on to Laura Petway Bennett. And, um, and you can see this, it's a very different place. Um, uh, 
So, wait, you if know, you have a question, please put it in chat. Okay. okay. Yeah. The last one reminded me of Marsden Hatley. Marsden Hartley, sure. Yes. You know, Marsden Hartley drew a lot from folk art, from, from basically, and so that's totally in, in you know, and who else? Milton Avery, uh, again, folk art. Um, so the, the parallels between looking at the freshness of expression in these pieces, modernist artists look at that stuff and say, you know, there's a vitality to these things that I want in my work. Look at these pieces. I mean, these are incredible things. I, I, go, I go to see a lot of art shows in New York. I go, to, I go to gallery hopping. And if I walked into a gallery and saw anything even close to this, I'd be thrilled. <laughs> Not that there aren't good things in galleries that are that are contemporary, but I, I'm telling you, there's something about what these folks were able to do. Um, and this is this is Laura Bennett's little little thing, uh, which which I really did want to read. Um, so she's she's one of the youngest. Of these of these folks, um, and actually, let me let me go on to the next. There she is. Okay, so she was she's um, about sixty at this point. Most of the others are, you know, 70, 80. There's very few that are even in their sixties. So this is it's it's a it's an art that is. Um, seeing an end at this stage of the game, which is, which is a shame. But she's picking up the tradition. The first quilt shows of Gee's Ben quilts opened in Houston, Texas in September 2002. There you go. Uh, there my eyes were open and it touched me in a way as to question myself. Can I make a quilt? that someday might hang on the wall of the museum. At that time, according to me, the answer was no way, no way. Not after seeing my relatives quilts hanging in a museum. They had been making quilts for generation after generation. Several months passed and the G's Ben exhibition opened in New York. Still, I had not made any quilts, at least not adult quilts. Finally, after hearing all the great news reports about my ancestors' quilts, I decided to try my hand. After all, I am an offspring of some of the great quilt makers of G's Band. I came to realize that my mother, her mother, my aunts, and all the others from G's Bend had sewn the foundation. All I had to do now was thread my own needle and piece the quilt together. Larry? Yeah. Somebody wrote, um, there are some G's Bend quilts for sale on Etsy. Oh yeah. Is they're, it like they're still growing? It's oh yeah, they're they're out there. They are. Um they they um they do gallery shows and things like that. Um and and as as we see, this show that's gonna be in in uh in Baltimore is is you know, it should be up right now. Somebody else mentioned, did you see the best butler quilts at the Katona Museum this summer? She made portraits out of quilting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of people approaching quilting from a lot of different directions. And, and I, I, will, I will touch on some more of that um, later on in the month. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very different, very different thing, but really... Yes, that's wonderful. 
Okay. So, Larry, most of the ones shown today are newer ones? No, okay. they are not. They are not. There's, it's a mix. Uh, some, some were from the 30s, some were from the 50s, some were from the 40s. There, there were a few from the 60s, a lot in the 70s. And, and, then, and then, you know, the, the, the later ones that I was just showing were, were relatively recent. So, okay, here we go. Uh, basically, this is the uh, soulsgrowndeep.org. Um, G's Ben Quilt Makers. And if you go there, you'll go to the website. You can scroll down and actually there's, there's all these different quilt makers. You can click on them and it'll open up to a page and then you can click on the quilt and it'll get big on your screen. I recommend it highly. I had a I had a ball the past week researching this one, um, and then um, there's also the Quilt Makers of G's Ben, which is which is this wonderful, funny, crazy, poignant <laughs> doc that that um, William Arnett and and his sons are are in, and the and they talk with the ladies all the time, you know. Basically, when Arnett showed up down there, these ladies looked at him like he was from some other planet. He's talking to them and he's saying, well, you know, um, I, I'll pay you, I'll pay you $300 for this quilt. And these ladies have been selling them for 15 bucks. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're, you know, he's telling them, you know, basically there's a market for these. They can sell for 2300 2,500, you know, things like that. And, and um, there's this interview in, in the doc where, where this one, one lady just said, I thought he was crazy, but I just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> he changed our lives. Um, one com one person commented on this, the quilt we're seeing right now. Yes, it says this looks like a beautiful but conventional quilt. Yes, it is. So different but from the others. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's a it's a standard star um, uh, quilt. But look at the changes in it. Look at look at the the backgrounds on each one of those quadrants. Nothing's duplicated. There, the, you know, in in. In conventional quilts, you kind of play duplicating throughout. And also, look at the funkiness of the thing. Look at look at how wiggly the edges are. And you know, basically, this is it. It's conventional, and yet they take it someplace else. They take it another step. So. Uh, that was our journey through Gee's Bend. And I, I had a great time. I hope you did. Um, Larry, so, do you know what the, um, oh, wait one second. Do you know what the uh, town area looks like today economically? Uh, it, it, it's, in, it's in much better shape due to the sales of these quilts. Um, you know, basically, they now have uh, they have refrigerators. They have deep freezes. They have stoves. They have electricity and running water. <laughs> so yes, the impact of of the exposure to the art. I mean, people are people go from come from Australia to buy a quilt at G's Bend at this point. Um, you know, people are showing up all the time. Wow. So there's, they have a central building down there that they, that they display the quilts and sell out of. Um, so yeah, there we have it. Ne next week, we're going to do uh, Sam Gillum, um, who is basically, there's, there's uh, pieces of his up at Dia Beacon, but I'll, I'll talk about his work and um, <clears throat> The week after, we're doing Solomon Tour, and and he's got uh, paintings at the Whitney. 
Um, but we're also going to explore contemporary black artists in their collection and uh, dealing with contemporary issues. Um, and then the week after, we're going to do uh, Jordan Castile, who is an extraordinary painter. She does portraits of, of people of color, and they're really wonderful pieces, too. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and I don't want to forget about Monday. Um, there's, we're showing a film, um, Mary Lou Williams, who is a wonderful uh, pianist, jazz pianist. Um, I saw this, this doc and, and it's really a terrific documentary. Um, and after the documentary is, is screened, um, uh, Carol Bash, who is a friend of mine, um, who is the director and, and person who basically put the piece together, um, um, will be there for Q and A. So um, I think that's about it. Well, Larry, thank you. This was, I, I, I love it. We had two quilters at the library. Yes. You know, the former director and the former benefits manager. Yes. And we used to look at their quilts, but you know, these were extraordinary, as you said. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Place for me to go look at. <laughs> thank you all for coming. And uh, we hope to see you for all the programs. Go to the Chappaqua Library website, which is chappaqualibrary.org, and look at all the programs we're ha having in February, including those celebrating Black History Month. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.